Hello and welcome to this Q&A associated with the UK premiere of Nuclear at Braindance and I'm delighted as you can see there's a whole range of people um, here and we're going to have a bit of a chat about the film and um, then I hope also you'll be submitting some questions via the, the Q&A box um, at the bottom of the screen so just type in your question there. So if I can introduce, um, I'm not sure what order you're seeing everybody in but uh, the director, Catherine Lindstrom, and writer also, and co-writer, David John Newman. Um, and from the cast, there's George Mackay, Sienna Geary, I'm just going around the screen here, the way I'm seeing it, Oliver Cooper-Smith, and uh, Noriko Sakura at the bottom. <laughs> Hi, hi everybody, and thank you very much. Amelia Jones was hoping to be with us, but uh, sadly she's caught up filming somewhere in North America and can't get off set at the moment. So let's start, Catherine, with you, with the, the whole idea. And John, you may want to come in on this as well. Uh, David, sorry, John, you may want to come in on this. Um, the whole kind of idea, I mean, where, you know, everything starts with a kind of a germ of something. What was it with this? Uh, I think it started with the nuclear power station, um, which is at the heart of the story and is something that David and I had been aware of for years, um, that the real nuclear power station that we used in the film, which um, is in Snowdonia. So it's a big, uh, massive, brutalist piece of architecture in the middle of a national park. And every time we would drive up to Snowdonia from where we live in South Wales, we would see this big um monstrous thing um sort of breathing in the middle of the landscape and I think that was probably the first inspiration although I think this was a story that came like many stories from several different places at once and then they were put together I don't know what you think David was also at the heart of the story to begin with yeah definitely it was a combination of all different ideas that we've had really and, and we, we have Sorry. Go on. No, no, go on. Go on, Catherine. Well, I was just going to say that we also had, um, I don't think it was originally a, a supernatural story that just kind of came out, but we were inspired by quite a lot of things. And one of them was um, stories about things that happened at Fukushima, yeah. um, about ghosts in taxis, and then also stories about um, about uh, young people who would brutalise their own parents. So that was kind of another thing that we brought in. And then we also wanted to have this character which ended up being George, who was based on James Kingston, the crane and very tall building climber. So we wanted something about him because we thought he was just such an interesting character. So it, it just, you know, we just started adding things to the pot, if you like, and then the story came out. Mm. Well, um, Sienna and George, I mean, maybe just, you might have thoughts about, I mean, one of the things that when you've got a, a film like this that is weaving elements of the supernatural or the, the not quite realistic with, um, uh, you know, real realism, is it, how important is it to kind of play it absolutely, you know, for real? I mean, not, not in the sense, to, the ambiguity is all there in, this, in the script, but the characters have to be in every moment completely plausible, don't they? Hi, Sienna, do you want to jump in? <laughs> I was hoping you would. <laughs> right. um, After I, you. I, I think, it, for me, I, I love the script and I love the story, but I, I loved the, sort of the sense of peacefulness. There was a sense of ease of this sort of metaphysical transformation and a sense of being able to experience something that otherwise might be experienced very differently when you're experiencing through somebody else's eyes almost. Um, and there was a serenity to it that I found very interesting. And, I, and I, I, I think that's very rare and very beautiful. And I find that, I found that very beautiful about the film, especially with what Noriko was doing. Yeah, yeah, we'll come to come to Noriko just in a second. Uh, George, because your, your character is, for, it was really interesting to know who it was based on an actual person um, and I mean he the moment you meet him there's something there is something kind of magical and slightly unreal about what he's done and everything about him and there he is just suddenly found in the middle of the landscape I mean what what was your what was your approach towards him yeah I kind of that's what I I loved that double level that kind of runs through all of the script um I could yeah I kind of thought 
I sort of th- saw him as a kind of angel, to be honest, as a sort of like caught in between. And and I guess to go back to your previous question a wee bit, like I don't know what I loved in the sort of in the writing of it and in the doing of it and in the film itself is I I think in a in a good way, in a complex way rather than a vague way, it never comes down hard on one side as to like in the playing of that character, whether you have to make a hard decision of where and what he is and kind of what that does to the reality or whether playing firmly to the reality and disregarding any sense or awareness of what he could represent or be. I think there's a sort of balance of kind of having your toe in either one and leaning either way a wee bit. And and so I, I don't know, I, I I think that sort of, that duality is kind of in a way sort of truer to, to life and how we sort of see the world, you know, that the, that, that it could there could be a lot of things all at once um so yeah I, I just I just loved sort of playing around within that sort of space and Catherine was always really open to kind of the sort of bigger more spiritual sort of readings of it and the hard fast reality of the situation too now, Oliver your character has I mean this tremendous sense of threat obviously that we feel right from, obviously right from from the outset of the film there but but again as it develops I mean without giving anything away for anybody who hasn't seen it you know there are layers and layers there too aren't there yeah of course I think um <clears throat> excuse me the uh just to go back to your last question that the sort of having to play it very natural and very real mm. I found was useful but because of this supernatural element it, it, it allowed a luxury to be slightly more dramatic or slightly larger than than you would find this character in real life which was a real luxury to have because there's something with the brother that there is this supernatural element that looms throughout the whole film but there's a, there's a darkness with him that that sometimes he doesn't even quite know why he's doing things like there's little looks over his shoulder as if something's even following or calling him a certain way so it, it felt like there was a, there was another level to it that you could play which was really exciting rather than just sort of this normal natural level Mm. which I, I loved, really enjoyed it. And Norika, you are this extraordinary presence um, who gradually starts to mean more and more to us as the film goes along. But I, I mean, it, it, that again seems to draw on. Uh, the film actually so makes so many connections all the way through with with areas way beyond geographical areas or, or apart from you know any metaphysical areas, but geographical areas way beyond North Wales, you know, and so... <laughs> <laughs> Did you? I mean, is that sort of kind of not a revenant, but that that kind of figure is she? Is is that something that would be familiar in Japanese culture? Yes, um, I hope you know everybody watched already this film, so I I can't I don't say so much uh, spoiler, but uh, obviously my character is a Japanese character, um, then and also um, quite supernatural. But the sort of for Japanese, um, as a Japanese, like my role is sort of deeply, deeply uh, believable. Mm-hmm. Um, such a things happen. Um, and of course, everybody uh, can't live forever. And so we believe such a things happen. And then of course, geography, I, you know, such a far away, I, my character came from Japan. But uh, that the level, uh, I'm not sort of, uh, in a way, I try to do, in a way, realistically, but uh, my character is not real. But uh, so we can, we can move anywhere. Uh, we can connect anybody so easily. And I hope, uh, I be, yeah, I hope uh, such a, you know, help, help uh, when everybody passed that passage between this life and the next life. Mm-hmm. And especially this theme, uh, nuclear, uh, also, of course, it, you know, it happened in Fukushima, everybody know. Um, so I'm like almost telling people who lost life uh, for that instant, uh, so I hope uh, resonate that kind of level. I hope. Okay, um, 
Catherine and, um, well, and uh, David, I mean, there's one thing I, I've felt with these very beautiful sequences with the power station, which looks like this wonderful kind of castle. But it, once we got into some of those power station areas, it immediately reminded me of, of Tarkovsky and Stalker and the idea of the zone and being anywhere. Was that with you when you were thinking about it? Uh, yeah, I think it was. Um, I think we we tried not to make it too obviously that, but I think Stalker, I think Stalker was a great influence on both of us individually, just on us as as creative people, um, and certainly that that sent that idea of something where a place where something happens, where some huge transformation happens, and it seemed as though a nuclear power station is. Is almost like the closest you get to another dimension that's in this world because it's so powerful and actually being around that power station which has been decommissioned um but it's sort of being slowly dismantled there is a feeling which is really quite frightening um and we, we never went inside but just being around the perimeter fence and just looking at it it's just has a has a real presence and it does feel like you're you're just within a hair's breadth of of another world mm -hmm. it'd be great to believe that uh, some of the poetics of tarkovsky has been absorbed into our creative output yeah. because of course he he was a genius Absolutely. So I'm going to start with um, some of the questions that have that have come in. Um, this is a question from Emily Leddy. Um, it's for George, but I think everybody could probably have the same, which is that, um, you know, if, if you're doing uh, a part that is, I mean, in this case, obviously, you were out on location a lot of the time. I mean, how do you look after yourselves? Is it, she's wondering with, you know, when you're playing Ned Kelly or whatever, that very demanding, physically very demanding things. And, and actually here you have to go plunging into a lot of cold water and one way or another. But um, I just, you know, you're off. We would, Oliver was saying beforehand that he was, he was in a you know, remote cottage out there. Is, is, when you're out on a location like this, is, is that an issue apart from doing your work? I think the best remedy is to live with Ollie Cooper Smith. It's probably <laughs> probably the best thing that anyone can do. Um, <laughs> genuinely, um, no. I, I think I think eat lots, sleep when you can, and and listen to your body, and that will that will that will do you grand in all in all senses. You were very good at it, George. Actually, you. I think you were training at that point for Nicola, but you were in the gym a lot. You were very you were eating very healthy. You were in bed early. Um, a really boring housemate, actually. <laughs> yeah. Let's be frank. But yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So were you? I mean, it was in Snowdonia, wasn't it, that you made this? Is that right? Yeah. So it was. I mean, I think also, yes. George did have to plunge into freezing cold water, and Amelia did have to keep being having water thrown all over her and running. And sometimes it was cold. And I think one of the. I mean, nobody ever complained. It's just that's what they do. They get on with it. And and I think one of the things about it's a shame that Stella, the producer, isn't here, but I think one of one of her talents as a producer is that she brings the right team of people together. So there was no chance of our having anybody there who's going to be fussy and 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 complain and expect to be wrapped up in blankets. Um, we did have to check George's heart after he'd been in the cold water. <laughs> we did have to have a medic and we were like, I hope you're right, but Luckily, somebody said, no, we had to make sure he was OK. Um, but, you know, it's, um, yeah, good actors get on with it. We didn't have time, though, really, to uh, not get on with it, did we? We had, how long did we have? Three weeks, was it? All in we had all? 18 days, yeah. 18 oh. days. Yeah, yeah, and we, but everyone, a lot of it was nights, wasn't it? We were filming a lot of nights, and everyone just sort of, you know, got stuck in and, and was really supportive and kind all the time, and, and you just feel that energy when you're around when you're when you're working so it was a it was actually a lovely set to be on mm -hmm. wasn't it it was beautiful oh so nice it was so low Amelia I mean Amelia's not here and it's such a shame she's the most wonderful soul to work with she's so generous and kind and there and present and anchors all of us um she's a brilliant creation as a role written and um, but also what she herself brings to it just her natural energy and her natural delight and love of people and life 
I think really shines and shows and it's just joy to be around her as well as all of you guys. <laughs> Well, I have to say lots of lovely messages coming in from people saying how much they enjoyed it and how much, well, how much, how they were gripped by it, really. Um, somebody's quite interested in, in the theme of that. This is uh, from Hedvig, who's interested in the theme of the tea ceremony as a metaphor for the calming of the wandering soul. Who would like to chip in on that one? <laughs> yes, uh, tea ceremony is also very spe uh, special and spiritual, isn't it? And cleansing. Um, and uh, yeah, I, personally, I haven't trained because I need proper training. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so for that thing, day. just like practice watching a lot of YouTubes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know that you, that's one thing you learn on YouTube. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, now, there's a question from Karen, who uh, is, this is for uh, Catherine and David John, um, which is really the, your motivation to make a film about trauma, she says, and hallucinations, which depends whether you think they're hallucinations or not, of course. There we are. <laughs> uh, David, or, well, okay, I think we both like really dark things. If you look at the shelves behind David, where he's sitting, you can see the workings of his mind kind of writ large. Cool. <laughs> Zoom in. Um, I think that's what we're interested in. I think we're interested in 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 human experience at its most difficult, at crucial moments. Um, I don't think we would ever do a romantic comedy. Um, we might try, but it would probably end up being really dark and, and probably supernatural as well. So I think it's. Um, that's what we're interested in. And I think what happens a lot with the stories that we come up with together is that they might start out as, as something which is very much about real human experience. And it could be um, with, an, with another kind of treatment, it could be a kind of, um, I suppose it could be a Ken Loach film or it could be, um, I can't think of anybody else now, but it could be something which is just about human experience, but we always find that it starts to go into another metaphysical dimension um, with a supernatural or something else happening to it. I'm not sure if that answers the question. No, I th but anyway, I, I, I said the words. I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> You said supernatural, and my cat appeared. So clearly, yeah, I know. <laughs> it was a wonderfully sort of witchy moment. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so this is from Lauren Geary, um, and Lauren wants to know what drew you actors um, to the script. And this is coming from an aspiring writer who wants to know what it is that <laughs> hooks you in. Well, interestingly, I am. Um... I first heard about nuclear because I had a tape for Boy, which is George's part. And I, I remember reading the script and I loved it. I, I just thought it was, the dialogue was excellent. That's the first thing that sticks out to me normally about a script is the dialogue. Mm. And it was excellent and I, I was, I loved it, but there wasn't, it just didn't quite click. I just felt like it wasn't quite right. So and I said to my girlfriend at the time, this is a George Mackay part. And I'd never met George, I just loved everything that he'd done. I was a big fan. You can mute this, George, if you don't want the compliments. But, um, and I, I, I hadn't heard anything for a few days. And then strangely, I went to the theater to see a friend in a play and George was there. And I got chatting to George and I saw him and I said, oh, nice to meet you mate. And we got chatting and then I said, what are you working on? And he said, oh, I'm doing a film called Nuclear. I thought, you bastard. <laughs> and I thought, that was the first thought. And then the second thought was I should go into casting. This is brilliant. <laughs> anyway, the next day, I then got uh, an email saying, can you come and tape or, or meet for the brother? And then I read the brother part with a you know, different hat on and it just clicked, just something made sense to me about it. And then it all just kind of unraveled for me. And then, you know, three weeks later down the line in Wales, in, in, a, in a cottage living with George. Hell you were. It's funny how those things turn out, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, for me, the script, sorry, no, George, you next. No, 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 please. Um, the, I, the most beautiful script and um, 
uh, I managed to jump in because somebody else jumped out because they had to be somewhere else or something happened. I can't remember what happened, but I managed to be in the right place at the right time. But the minute I read it, I was just, it was like someone crawled inside my head and written a dream. It's very rare to read a script where the dialogue is sparse, but so powerful that it feels like things you've heard and said. Like this, this funny thing of like Florence wetting the bed and just little things that hang and stick. And it felt like a dream that you're having and you're trying to explain it to somebody, but it feels more real than a, than a real thing happening. But there was something about it that for me felt more genuine than most stories which are more plausible. It just felt entirely plausible and also a story that needed to be told. Of, you know, how do you know what's going on afterwards or before? And how do you know who's there and who isn't really there? Especially if you're losing people you love, sometimes you really feel like they're with you. Um, and I think everybody's experienced that. And I just thought it was really touching. And I love the way that the mother um, cares so much for her daughter that she doesn't want to sort of show the pain. Um, and she tries to sort of hide the pain, her physical pain, but at the same time, she's intensely worried about all these things happening and can't control it. And it's this bubbling, weird unease, and yet this strange opposite sense of calm and everything should be happening like this. And it's kind of weird, but yeah, amazing. Mm. Okay, um, actually, David, John, Catherine, I mean, since, um, this is from, this question is from, from Lauren, who is an aspiring writer. Um, you know, if you're an aspiring writer and you want people to read your scripts, I mean, any general tips? God, spend a long time writing scripts. <laughs> yes. Get it right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think maybe also think about the audience all the way through and think about their experience. Yeah. Don't think about what you're, uh, if you're being clever or yeah. it's not for you, it's for an audience and and actors will see through that because actors want to experience something with it for an audience as well. So I suppose if you're thinking about, yeah, what is the audience experiencing through this story? How are you taking them through this story? What are you showing them? What are you revealing to them and what are you hiding from them? Maybe that's the thing. And go through a lot of pain as well. It's cry, quite pain. cry yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's quite a painful process, but then beauty was given birth to at the end. So that's good. But then you kind of forget as well, don't you? It is like it is a bit like childbirth. You go, oh, it wasn't too bad. It was all right. Let's do another one. <laughs> Well, we've probably got time for a couple more questions and there's one, uh, there's one funny one and there's one really heavy one. So uh, which one would you like first? <laughs> Should we have the heavy one first? Yeah, good. Who's it for? Thinking. First of all, who's it for? It's actually, but, well, it's for everybody really. Um, and this is from Jessica Ann Kovalik and she says, you know, especially now the world outside is cold and dark. She says, how can filmmakers negotiate their stories to equally reflect the reality of our society, but also provide a place of escapism for the audience? Is it possible to accomplish both or does one or the other need to be omitted? That is a big question. That is a big question, isn't Over it? Over to you, George. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I like, I, I, I feel, I feel absolutely, absolutely like, in terms of that's and again not just sort of doing like a kind of segue back to this but this is kind of this is what this this script does is it it i think you kind of i think the the bigger questions of life or what or or anything are sometimes almost too big to encapsulate in in a two hour film or an hour and a half film or a series or a novel you kind of need to focus on something really small really intensely and that sort of reverberates out and and so I think in doing that, unconsciously, if it will either be in your subconscious or in people's subconscious, what's going on in that bigger level? You know, you, you make a script about, you know, a bug stuck in under a glass or something, and it might feel like lockdown, you know, and it, but you don't have to say it's about those two things at once. But uh, so I think you kind of give, give credit to the sort of the situation seeping in and, and people's own unconscious, and then just sort of maybe... Uh, and then just write something maybe maybe smaller uh, and and either but it or or perhaps you might know what you're using that 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 metaphor you might not know 
I'm so, I don't know because I'm not a writer, but I, I I don't I imagine that it's it's either the, the choice is either just to focus on something and not think about it outside of that small sense and let that the bigger circle be done by others, or you think of the bigger circle and then work backwards from that to go right. I can't say that, so I'm going to say it through this keyhole. If you know what I mean? Yeah. No, I think I think that's really, and, and also if, if things are specific enough, is that if something is true enough to the story, as you say, whatever the scale, then people will read things into it anyway, won't they? Okay, who else? Yes. Yeah. Stay on that. Anybody else? Mm. I could, but I bet Sienna can. Yeah, and Sienna's cat. <laughs> Sienna's cat. Really, really fussy cat. The children are really well behaved. The cat, on the other hand, is not. <laughs> Yeah, she's taking advantage of lockdown but I, you know I, I think I think more than ever we have a responsibility to tell stories of people and show what humanity is and how to connect and use story as a way to connect to other people that's you know that's the whole point of what we do it's like oh I understand that feeling I understand what it might be like to live somebody else's life to stand in someone else's shoes to breathe somebody else's air you know and that's the point of it all, I think. Right. Um, I think, oh, oh, sorry, if I can just very quickly say that I think the idea in these difficult times is not to run away from, from what we are as human beings and not to try to find escapism. I mean, I know sometimes we do need to have just fun and laughter and watch silly things, but the, what will really get us through is, as Sienna said, I think about understanding about human connection and and really confronting those things face on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so the final, to, for a final thing, um, there was just a question, George, about the backwards jump on the, uh, by the reservoir. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, you practiced a lot of time for that. <laughs> that was me at the very beginning and the very end and, and a much more accomplished backflipper for the main backflip. But I did teach myself to backflip because I really wanted to, but I wasn't, I wasn't allowed in the end. But I do have photo evidence of when there's foam involved, um, I can absolutely do a backflip. Um, <laughs> well, I he mean, really did yeah. want to do it and he could have done it. He really could have done it. It was all about, he, he wouldn't have been able to, if he'd broken a leg or something, yeah, it yeah. would be okay if we did it right at the end of our shoot, but some other people might have been a bit annoyed if he then so couldn't move on to the next. <laughs> I can actually do three backflips, but you know. oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, much respect, and much respect to all of you for uh, it was a fantastic film, and uh, you know, grateful for all the questions that came in. Thank you for those. But uh, Sienna, George, I'm just going along the row here. Oliver, Catherine, David, John, and Noriko, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye. 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 Bye.